everyone. Can you hear me okay without a mic? All right. Great to see everyone. It's so great to see so many of UCLA Law's public interest students and community here. Um, so just really briefly, for those who haven't met me yet, I'm Karen Wong. I'm the Executive Director of the STEAM Program in Public Interest Law and Policy. I want to thank you all for joining us today for our very first Margaret Levy Public Interest Fellow Lecture of the Year. We do two of these a year, um, and one in the spring, one in the fall, and one in the spring. Um, the Dean, in a minute, is going to introduce our fabulous Fall 2023 Levy Fellow. Um, but before we begin, I just wanted to acknowledge our presence today on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Tonga people and their role as traditional land caretakers at Tavangar, which includes the Los Angeles Basin of which the UCLA campus is a part of. Um, one housekeeping comment, which is that um, you should have we should have time for questions at the end of our fellows talk uh, today. Um, so I ask you to hold questions till um, we ask for them at the end. And with that, I'm actually going to ask you to please join me in welcoming Dean uh, Michael Watterson, who will uh, introduce our fall 2023 Levy Fellow. Thank you, Karen. For those of you that I've not met, my name is Michael Waterstone. I have the honor of being the dean of our law school. Uh, thank you for coming today. I realize I'm learning there is so much programming and so many opportunities to do different things at lunch, and the fact that you're choosing to be here and, and learn from our speaker today uh, I think says a lot and means a great deal. So thank you for being here. Um, uh, I also want to thank Maggie Levy, who will be coming in a little later for her support that helps uh, drive this program. So certainly when she does come, if you know, feel free to say thank you and you appreciate uh, what she's doing. So this e each semester, the Margaret Levy Fellowship brings to UCLA an outstanding public interest lawyer uh, to share her cutting edge work and to provide ac advice and mentorship to students who are pursuing public interest careers. Um, I guess we are in our sixth year and our Levy Fellows have inspired our students with their work ranging from individual clients to litigating class actions, protecting civil rights to reforming criminal legal system, and from enforcing laws to lawyering on behalf of grassroots movement. This year, given the ongoing housing and unhoused crisis in Los Angeles and California, uh, I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to hear from Rashida Phillips, who has worked on housing issues at both the local and national levels. So Rashida is the Director of Housing at PolicyLink, which is a national research and action institute advancing racial and economic equity by lifting up what works. At PolicyLink, she leads the organization's advocacy to support tenants' rights, housing, and land use movements, and provides the trainings at the intersection of housing and racial justice. Before this, she led the housing policy campaigns at Community Legal Services in Philadelphia, uh, where her work included numerous legislative victories, including improving renters' rights and securing the right to counsel for tenants facing eviction. In addition to her advocacy, Rashida is an internationally recognized and accomplished artist. So we welcome her to CLA Law today for her talk on Future Foundations Building Racial Equity in Housing, which addresses the need for housing justice uh, approaches that confront deep roots of systemic racial inequalities and the disproportionate burden of housing instability borne by black and brown communities. So Rashida, on behalf of UCLA Law, thank you for being here. Uh, we're really grateful that you're giving us your time and energy and space. Um, and I apologize, I now need to leave to go over to do a similar exercise in another room. So uh, thank you guys for coming out today. Uh, thank you, Rashida. Thank you. Hello. Check, check, check. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rashida. Thank you so much for the gracious introduction, and thank you for having me. Um, I am new to California. I've been living here for about three years in Los Angeles, so I am local now. Um, but I'm from Philadelphia, um, from the East Coast, through and through. So it's just such a pleasure to be here now that I've been here a couple of years. I'm starting to get into the context of what's happening in, in California, across the state. Um, and also through my work at PolicyLink, um, we have a deeply held California strategy that I'm happy to talk about um, if we get an opportunity to on Wednesday. Um, but just it's just such a pleasure to be here um, at this time for me. So um, as, as the dean 
said, um, my career, my background started off um, in legal services. So I graduated from Temple University Law School back in I think 2008, if I can re recall um, correctly, and started off um, in at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. Um, so started off with a very varied, actually, career. I, I had started off, I was interning at um, CLS for my 2L and 3L year. Um, and CLS is an organization in Philadelphia that does both direct legal services and they do systems-based um, policy and systemic work um, as well. And so just really had the opportunity to engage in both sides of, of those things um, coming into my work. Um, but I started off at CLS as an intern and then uh, came on as a fellow my, um, after I graduated. And the work that I was doing there beginning was in child welfare law. So I was representing parents who were caught up in the child welfare system in Philadelphia. Um, but then when I started as a fellow at CLS, they put me actually in a unit called um, the Community Economic Development Unit, which is no longer there, but where I was uh, representing child care providers. So I was doing a very obscure area of law called child care law, uh, where I was representing um, small child care providers, daycares, um, family daycares, up to big daycares, helping them do all the things that, you know, they needed in order to maintain or start up their child care business. So that included doing zoning hearings, helping them to look at a, a uh a commercial space or look at their home to make sure it complied with the laws, helping them get licensed, all those things. But one of the things that that area of law really did for me was it helped me to understand how to approach um, legal work with a community lawyering uh, approach and with community lawyering sort of, of ways. Um, because that work was so unique within CLS, like most of the work that CLS does, right, is that really crisis-based work, and that was the work that I would come to do when I moved into the housing work. But that opportunity really gave me an opportunity to represent people as groups, to represent communities, to be guided by a community sort of vision of what they wanted to see next. So especially when I was doing work around zoning reform in Philadelphia, help, helping to reform the zoning code um, to make it more equitable for child care providers, I was led by them. It wasn't like me coming in, and I was especially being a new attorney, um, didn't quite know what I was doing right, but being led by a community of folks that was organized already um, to get what they wanted. And so after that, um, I um, moved into doing mortgage foreclosure defense. That was in 2008, 2009, around the time of the big foreclosure crisis and in, in, um, in, in, in the country, and it hit Philadelphia especially hard. So I was put into our um, for mortgage foreclosure defense unit, did that work for a little bit, did bankruptcies and, and other things, um, and then had an opportunity to move into our landlord-tenant unit, which is where I stayed for 10 years after that, um, first starting off as a staff attorney, representing people who were, doing, who were living in public housing, um, and then I became managing attorney and then was doing everything. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, so that was where I landed and then thought I was going to be doing that forever. Like, I was really happy doing legal services work, but truth is I got burned out at a certain point, didn't quite understand what burn, burnout meant. Um, but what it led to was, like, me just wanting some distance from the work. So I left it for a little bit. I, I went and moved on to an organization called Shriver Center on poverty law, which is based in Chicago. And so this was right before the pandemic, um, and it was around the time where Sh um, Shriver Center had a team called the Advocate um, Resources and Training Team. So I joined that team um, in part because I had been through one of their training institutes, which, which was a racial justice institute. And so going through that Racial Justice Institute at Shriver Center, it's, a, it's an institute that they have that's six months long, um, that's for public interest attorneys and, and um, advocates. And so you basically go through that and learn how to apply racial equity strategies, tools, thinking frameworks to your work. And so that just totally changed the way that I approached my work, the way that I um, held, held our campaigns, um, you know, and again, being informed by representing folks who were in um, already organized in communities, really being able to bring those approaches into my work in housing. And so through learning, or through the learnings that I got through the Racial Justice Institute, we were able to um, really take on a campaign like Right to Counsel in Philadelphia, um, transform it in a way that it was centering racial equity in that campaign. And I, I strongly believe that is why we were able to win in the way that we were able to, um, and to transform really the narrative around um, racial justice and housing um, as it applied in Philadelphia. So blah, blah, blah. I can talk more about like sort of my trajectory, but I want to sort of get into um, the lecture in terms of applying these approaches and, and things to housing. Um, so long story short, I ended up at PolicyLink, um, left, uh, left community services a couple years ago. 
Um, and so at PolicyLink, um, I am not practicing as an as a attorney, right, but again, really focusing on policy work um, from a national perspective, but also still able to do this really deeply local work, working with communities um, who are guiding us on, on the approaches that they want to take and the sort of policies that they want to advance. So um, at PolicyLink, we serve the... Oh, here we go. We serve, <laughs> we're a National Research and Action Institute. We served 100 million who are at or below the poverty line, approximately 106 million or one in three who are economically insecure. And so our approach is winning on equity, uplifting, lifting up what works. Um, and so what that means in housing, in terms of the sort of approaches that we take, um, looking at transform legal, regulatory, financial, and governance systems, um, where we center people, not profits, we are looking to shift power in housing markets and governance specifically, and then supporting healthy communities of opportunity for all. So what that looks like in terms of the portfolio at PolicyLink and the sort of work that we're able to do there. Um, my housing portfolio includes land development and housing, equitable land disposition, et cetera, all things under that. Um, development, which can include zoning reform, inclusionary zoning, increased accountability and shared power and community planning processes, and then housing, um, increasing housing access, which includes tenant screening and um, right to counsel, just cause eviction, other tenant protections. Um, and so why is it necessary that we, uh, we're doing this and, and that we are uplifting the 100 million? And, right, and this intersects sort of, again, with the work that I was doing in Philadelphia. So when you look at... Um, when you look at who is burdened by housing, right? Who doesn't, who's not able to access housing, who's not able to maintain housing, um, we see that it's really a racial problem. It's a gender and racial equity problem. Um, and in Philadelphia, when I was doing this work, right, um, you know, again, started off doing housing uh, landlord-tenant work around 2010 or so. Um, in Philadelphia, which is a city of homeowners largely, um, has traditionally been a city of homeowners, when it came to what was happening with renters, there really just was no insight on, on these issues. One, because we weren't talking about it as a race equity issue. Two, because people thought of tenants as poor, right? And so if you're poor, like it's your fault, the reason why you're ending up being evicted or you're, you don't have housing instability. Um, folks were rarely talking about the, the racialized and gender nature of housing, right? And so um, we started to get this, get this information. And so, for example, in 2019, we know that black female renters are the most housing burden among renters of all racial, ethnic, and gender groups. In contrast, white male renters are the least housing burden. Um, with the pandemic, right, we saw this issue come into sharp relief and sharp contrast. And so PolicyLink, during the pandemic, started a um, rent debt in America calculator, rent debt calculator. And so, right, um, this, this has changed a little bit, but um, we've, during the pandemic, right, we for over $14 um, billion dollars in, in, in back rent that families were facing, um, about 5 um, million households behind on rent, and then many of those households having children, right? And then who is it hitting most? People of color, um, people who are low income, people who are unemployed, and households with children are the most burdened as well. And so this really reflects what we see in places like Philadelphia, right? Those are national statistics. But when we look at places like Philadelphia, um, we see that, that that is a microcosm of what we see nationally. So Philadelphia's eviction landscape reflected um, those same things that we see um, on, on the previous slides, right? So Philadelphia's eviction rate, four times higher than its foreclosure rate, impacting nearly one in 14 Philadelphia renters. Um, again, when you have a city that totes itself as a city of homeowners, right, where um, the home ownership rate has traditionally been over 65%. Um, those things changed during the foreclosure crisis of 2008, where you now have more renters in the city. So if you look at the stats now, the home ownership rate is growing back up in Philadelphia, but it's almost half and half. And for a while, it was about 48% renters, 52%. And so with that, you're going to have more folks who are at risk of eviction um, in Philadelphia than you do um, homeowners. And then there's also... Um, you know, a vast difference in terms of the process for homeowners. If you're a homeowner losing their home, right, because of the values that we hold for homeowners, it can, we can play that out for two years, right? I can play that out. I can file a bankruptcy. I can do all these things that can drag that process out. For a tenant, um, the time periods are 30 days. And, you know, technically, legally, by the, um, by the law, 21 days after an eviction hearing, you're being evicted. And there's, there's 
very few things that you can do in that in those circumstances, right? So it's just a different landscape. But we didn't have this sense, you know, those of us who who weren't directly representing people didn't really understand the, the context and the nuance. Um, the other thing that we were seeing in the eviction courts: five to seven percent of tenants are represented in eviction court. Eighty-five to ninety percent of landlords are represented. Um, and then again, most importantly, that there was a very specific racial aspect of that. Um, what we were seeing in legal services, what we knew anecdotally, right, is that most of our clients, over 70% of the people that we were seeing in our intake room were black women, but we didn't have that information for the courts to know, um, you know, specifically how that was reflected. And so that was information that we had to get in order to really put um, a frame on this that, that where we understood who was being impacted by evictions, not just that evictions were happening and that um, it was because people can't pay their rent, but why they were happening, who they were happening to, um, and, that, and that would enable us to really attack where in the system that we could uh, address these issues. Right, so in Philadelphia, just looking back closer into those some of those issues that I talked about, right, a lot of these things are really global kind of issues, right? For example, we see around the country high rates of evictions for voucher holders, inability to access housing after eviction. Again, over 70% of the people being filed against in Philadelphia are black women. Um, you know, 22,000 eviction filings a year. And then we know where the highest rates of eviction are occurring. Um, and so that enabled us to sort of target, begin to target um, our strategies very specifically around who, how, right? And there's one way that you can approach these things where you're looking at the individual circumstances, um, right? And that, that that's not really changing the system, right? And it can be easy to fall into those traps, particularly working in legal services where, you know, we had our open our intake Mondays and Wednesdays for people um, who are facing eviction, right? We only have a set finite amount of lawyers. We have a finite amount of paralegals. So folks coming in, um, we can only serve a finite amount of people, right? And it may not be that we're getting the people who are most vulnerable. Um, and, and, and even in those circumstances, right, we're only representing people on their individual circumstances. It's not really leading us to make a dent in the sort of system because we don't really know what's happening because we don't have information. So that is what led us to do a lot of um, data pools in order to get the information that we need to, again, target our strategies towards the people who needed it most and, and where, where it was needed most in the system. Um, some of the things that helped us in Philadelphia and that um, are emerging sort of data pieces in other places, um, the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule. So I could talk to you about that all day if all, any of you are into fair housing issues. Um, it's, it's, it's a federal rule that essentially requires um, states, housing authorities, cities that get money from the federal government to do a planning process around fair housing. So we were, um, Philadelphia was required to engage in that process. That process gave us a lot of information, again, about who was being evicted, who was not able to access housing, who had housing vouchers that they weren't able to use. Um, for example, even though Philadelphia has a source of income protection, um, over two thirds of, of housing vouchers um, holders get rejected when trying to apply. Right, these kinds of reports gave us the information that we needed, again, to be able to say we're not just dealing with a situation where people are poor and so they're being evicted. There is something deeper going on here that, that relates to racial, gender, other forms of inequity. So all of this information helped us to be able to um, find that and, and to do that. And then it was really important to us to also not just pathologize, um, right, um, black women or black people or people of color because, you know, we tie, we, we're so easy to sort of tie poverty into race in these ways that, that just, you know, they're, they're true on the surface, but you really have to dig deeper in order, again, to that the systemic way, ways in which these things are playing out. So black women, for example, on average, are paid 63% of what non-Hispanic white men are paid according to the U.S. Census Bureau. So as a result of that, out of four million households headed by black women, one in four or one million are living below the poverty line. Um, and then according to the National Equity Atlas, um, as I said in earlier, 2019 white households had the lowest housing burden for renters, 36%. Black households had the highest housing cost burden, 58%. And so these grim disparities create our present reality where we see that over half of black and Hispanic renter households nationally are cost burdened, um, with black renters the most li likely to be severely cost burdened. And we see in places like Maryland and Philadelphia, the majority of severely rent burdened people are single mothers and overwhelmingly people of color. And so you may have heard of Matt Desmond, for example, his book, um, Evicted, um, really where he found that, for example, the mere presence of children in the household increases a tenant's risk of eviction. 
Um, and other studies have shown that black households pay more comparable housing costs even when they have similar median rents as other households, which compounds disparities in housing cost burdens. So this is something that we saw in Philadelphia as well. So when we started to zoom in and look at, again, who is being evicted and sort of overlay that with um, income and all of these other things, what we found is that regardless of income, black renters face the highest rates of eviction in the city, right? So it tells you, again, it goes beyond a poverty issue. And if we're approaching these things as a with, with just a poverty lens, we're going to miss all of these other things because it's not just about poverty. Um, it, it, it goes beyond that. And so, um, again, to sort of go back to the, the, um, the sort of underlying systemic issues, despite seeing some of the lowest wages women have some of the highest rates of educational attainment in the U.S., which just underscores, again, that complexity of the sort of structural and systemic barriers that prevent black women and people of color, women of color, from being able to access long-term housing. So again, in my experience, what I would see is, um, you know, eviction thrusts people into poverty, right? Someone who has a stable household, a stable job, um, someone who may not even have been evicted. So for example, I had a client who um, lived in public housing and because of the sort of punitive um, policies of that public housing, if she was late on her rent by two weeks, her manager had the right to file an eviction against her. And so she never stepped in court. Not one day did she step in court, right? But she, over the years, paid her rent late a few times and always resolved it. Had seven eviction filings against her for amounts of like, on average, $50, $75. Um, those eviction records, although she never stepped in court, never was evicted, right? follow her. And so she got a better job. She was able to get a job as a postal worker, wanted to move, could not move out of public housing because she has seven eviction records that are bringing down her tenant screening score. Right. So we see, um, despite things like income, despite things like education, um, the circumstances are such that um, black women and, and women of color, again, face these issues, face housing instability at higher rates than other folks. And so how do we sort of surface these problems, um, particularly using a community lawyering approach? Um, so for me, it's really important to share this because back when I was um, coming to law school, right, we didn't, we weren't taught about things like community lawyering and movement lawyering or, or taking these approaches. And even within the organization I was working with, we were encouraged to approach things from a community perspective, right? But working in housing, working in crisis work, that tends to overtake, you know, your ability to really do community-based work sometimes. Um, but it was really important and because I was manager of the unit, right, I was able to figure out ways to sort of build that in um, because we, we wanted to prioritize that. And that allowed us to approach a campaign like Right to Council in a totally different way than we might otherwise approach a housing campaign. So we were seeing what was happening in New York City around that time, 2015, 2016, where you really saw a tenants movement of folks um, bring Right to Council into the city and get passed into law, right? That wasn't a, a movement of lawyers, it wasn't a movement of, of advocates, it was a movement of tenants. We weren't able to do that same thing in Philadelphia. Um, we did not have a dedicated tenants union at that time. One did emerge a few years later that we were able to work with and, and um, bring into the fold and do a lot of mutual campaign support for each other. But at first, we didn't have that information. And so it was really important for us to surface the problem by going out into the community um, and finding other ways to approach the work that wasn't just your standard take someone on intake, get their information, you know, they get 20 minutes with you and then you got to hush them out the door to get into the next person. So it was important for us to meet people where they were at. We did community meetings, we did town halls, um, we did city council hearings where we really privileged the voices of people who were being impacted by evictions and who didn't have lawyers and things like that. We used art making and, you know, I, I so happened to be an artist, so I was able to really incorporate that. Um, and one of the things that I was able to do was um, I got a grant to open up a year-long community space in the heart of a community that was undergoing um, uh, redevelopment and being pushed out by some things that I won't talk about because I won't have time to do it today. Um, but essentially was able to open up a, a community space, a rent a community space for a year where we did work, housing, what we called housing futures workshops with community members. It was a space where they could walk in, get information, get resources, but also learn and connect with each other, um, right? And then we had those folks come out to city council hearings and create signs and create art and 
those things really pushed it over the edge in terms of getting the mayor's interest, getting other folks' interest, um, and again, not just creating a campaign that only lived in the legal services offices or where we, you know, our, I had the relationships and I could go and talk to a city council member, but it really is leaving out the whole community, um, right, and it just, it just changes the trajectory of things. Um, also, in terms of racial equity considerations, um, it was really important for us to not approach um, racial equity in this sort of flat, one-dimensional way, right? Because there's a way to do racial equity work where you're saying, oh, let's slap some equity. We're serving black people and brown people. Therefore, we are doing equity. That's, sorry, that's not equity. Um, so in terms of actually doing deeply held racial equity work that is actually going to change things, right? Um, that is actually going to move the power systems and, and um, actually bring about systemic change, it has to actively engage the people that um, it's focused on, right? So actively engaging black people and people of color in those campaigns, going out again to those communities, not acting like um, they should come to us when they're in crisis and that's the only way to engage folks. So we, we took concerted efforts to meet folks where they were and to engage the people and not just say, oh, we know now that mostly black people are being evicted, um, therefore we are doing equity work by virtue of just talking about this issue or focusing on this issue. Um, the campaign has to also reveal racial inequities. It has to be able to focus on systemic change, advance positive racial impacts, and expand public awareness of systemic racism. Um, and so what does this look like in practice? Let me just take some. Also, I'm happy to take questions along the way. We don't have to wait until the end. So feel free to interrupt me. Um, so again, the result of what we know um, around race equity, right, is the, is the things that we already know. The people that are most likely to be evicted all, all fall along racial and gender lines, um, most frequently impacting black women and their children, as I said. Um, and then these things get further entrenched in the system. So when someone's evicted, they then have an eviction filing that they carry with them forward. Um, and so when we're thinking about and dealing with these things and thinking sort of long term, again, it's really important that we not just think about the case that's in front of us or the situation that's in front of us, but figuring out how we can sort of weave these things into each other. And I think one of the things that I saw in my work was that housing tends to get siloed out as its own issue, right? We separate it from things like homelessness, and, and we see homelessness as a separate issue or a separate problem. Um, we see education, right, like kids um, not being able to get to school on time, being able to concentrate in school, which is often a result of having unstable housing. We, we just tend to silo out and disconnect these things. And for us, it was really important that we connected all of these things and that we started, you know, half the battle was starting with the media um, and getting the media to understand housing as a race equity issue. So I'm, I'm zooming in and out. So, right, like I'm talking part about sort of the national landscape, but I'm also want to give you guys very specific examples of how this plays out in a local area, um, sort of depending on, you know, kind of what you want, what you all want to get into and what level you might be working at if you go into um, sort of similar work. Um, so one of the things that was really important for us, um, particularly in our Right to Counsel campaign and some of the other campaigns that we were working on, um, was to work on the media. And that was like half the battle, because again, when, when it comes to narrative around housing issues, right, particularly when it comes to people who are low income or people who are poor, we tend to paint them with a broad brush. Um, and that was what was happening in Philadelphia. Um, Philadelphia media was afraid to talk about race um, for various reasons. It was really challenging to talk about race at that time. But one of the things that was helpful, right, was Matt Dedman's book coming out um, around 2015, 2016, Evicted, where he uplifted race, racial equity, right, a Pulitzer Prize winning book that some, uh, some people will pay attention to. So that was helpful. And then we really had to start talking about it ourselves. So in legal services, one of the things that we started doing was writing op-eds. Um, I wrote a bunch op-eds where I was able to, again, sort of using some of the race equity tools I had learned um, through the Racial Justice Institute, um, we, we wrote an op-ed. So when we have a tool to fix a Philly's, Philly's eviction crisis, right? I wrote that op-ed with one of my staff members at Community Legal Services where we're talking about right to counsel as a tool to fix eviction crisis, but we are centering it around racial justice issues, right? And so from after those op-eds, right, we start to see the media talking about it on its own. Um, we see an article by a, a couple months later um, in May after we wrote that op-ed in, in February in the same newspaper talking about Philly's eviction right to counsel, right? So just really being cognizant of how we talk about these things in the media and bringing that lens, um, right, and working on the media such that they take it and run with it, and it's not just something we have to keep talking about. 
Um, and then we saw down here, good cause eviction tenant protections, right? So one of the things that was happening in Philadelphia at that time was, again, we were seeing the emergence of the Philadelphia Tenants Union. And because of something that had happened in West Philadelphia, a mass eviction that had happened, um, we partnered with them on to support the tenants there. They had recruited a whole bunch of tenants, and as a result of a mass eviction, were working on a just cause eviction campaign. So that campaign was happening simultaneously as the Right to Council campaign. And while we wanted Right, right to Council to be the main tenant union's campaign, that's not how things work, right? That's not what they wanted. That's not what they were going for. But we found ways to collaborate such that we were supporting each other, right? Because we knew that you can have just cause eviction law. You still need Right to Council to support that because if a tenant ends up in court, right, um, and using good cause as a defense, it's it's helpful to have a lawyer there, right? So being able to connect those causes up, I think, was also what helped us to be able to win in the same year, um, almost unanimous passage of a good cause eviction law and right to counsel law of, within a few months of each other. Um, yeah, and then some other stuff about, you know, just stakeholder engagement and power building. Um, but it's really, I also want to share this, right, um, in terms of how we also analyzed this and figured out some of the ways in which we would intervene in these systems, right? So this is a chart called Choice Points, um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's just a sort of visual graph to help you to be able to figure out where are the points in a system where to intervene. And how we think about this is where are the points where someone is able to make a decision? And if that person's able to make a decision, discretion shows up. Um, and that discretion could be biased in some way. It could be racially biased. It could be biased because of a family, all these sorts of things, right? And so when we're thinking about the eviction system and how this applies in the eviction system, right, um, you have, and this is just, you know, we, we have to start somewhere. At least termination notice, but we can start actually way at the beginning of when you're first renting in terms of where decisions are being made. But in terms of a lease termination notice, um, this is a choice point in the eviction system for a tenant. So for a landlord, right, they have the choice of who they give an, a, a lease notice to, lease termination notice to. Um, and this starts, again, at the point that somebody's leasing up. Because, for example, in Pennsylvania, there is a law under the Landlord-Tenant Act where a tenant can waive a right to a lease termination notice. So that means that your landlord can put in your lease agreement that you waive any notice of a lease of a lease termination notice or notice to quit. And you sign that lease and therefore you do not get a lease termination notice if your landlord is terminating your lease, right? So that is a choice. That is this, a decision that someone is making, a landlord, a property manager at the beginning as to whether you get a lease termination notice. Right, and that, that can depend on how, how much money you have, the, the amount of rent, you you know, just all of these different factors, but it's where discretion shows up in the system. Service of an eviction complaint. That's another place where a decision is made as to who gets what. Um, you would think that anybody, everybody, right, should be entitled to service of an eviction complaint. Mm, not necessarily. So in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia in particular, um, you do not get served in hand with an eviction complaint. For every other type of case, right, if you go get taken a small claims court, you get personal service. That service gets handed to you. For an eviction complaint, they're allowed to post it on your door. They're allowed to tape it to a window. Anything could happen to that, right? A strong gust of wind could blow that, that, that um, complaint anywhere. So who gets service of complaint, right? A choice is made there. So I'm not going to go through all of these things, but just in terms of where you're thinking about intervening, um, thinking about where are the different places where choice shows up, and therefore discretion shows up, and therefore bias and, and, and inequity can show up. Right, and so this is ways in which we figured out where are the different places to intervene. And so at each of those points, right, it couldn't just be about having an attorney in court with you, right? Um, it, it can't just be about that. It has to be about how can we leverage that to change other things in the system. So part of our right to counsel campaign was not just getting more lawyers in court, but making sure that people got service of complaint, making sure that we change those systemic things to make it better. So one of the things, for example, is that they started having to log the time that they served a complaint, and it just helps a, a, a little teensy bit. Um, in terms of lease termination notice, that's a more systemic because it's a state law, um, but we did try to work on getting that knocked out of the landlord-tenant law. Um, so I'm going to talk for a few more minutes because I want to make sure that y'all get an opportunity to ask questions. Um, but in terms of the right to counsel legislation in Philadelphia, um, one of the things that happened there introduced in May 2019, it passed unanimously in December 2019. Um, it was modeled after New York City's and Newark's right to counsel legislation. 
guarantees a lawyer for tenants facing eviction and with incomes up to 200% of federal poverty line, includes a provision for community education. And we built that in. It was our sneaky way of trying to build in tenant organizing, getting funded through the right to counsel. They wouldn't put that in there, of course, but it funds community education, which sort of gets filtered through tenant organizations um, in Philadelphia. And then implementation prioritizes the lowest income and our zip codes with the highest rates of eviction. And so this correlates with areas of racially concentrated poverty where we see the highest rates of eviction in the city. So again, we couldn't put in a law of race equity consideration, but the way that the law is written in terms of prioritizing those zip codes, right, it overlays perfectly with where we see the highest rates of eviction happening, um, which is where black women and, and um, other people of color are concentrated in the city. And so um, it's the right to counsel rolled out by zip codes. It started rolling out last year. And the two zip codes that it rolled out in first is 19121 North Philadelphia and 19143 West Philadelphia. So again, two of the highest um, rates of concentrated poverty in the city. Um, so far, we've seen successes with the program. Um, tenants who work with the program are likely to show up in court. Um, the program is serving um, uh, over 10,000 tenants so far, and so it has shifted those rates of representation um, in terms of, I think it's at 15% um, legal representation for tenants, where it was once 3 to 5%. Um, and then it also utilizes, um, you know, it's, again, it extends beyond just what's happening in the courtroom, and it has a sort of no wrong door policy where you can go around to any of the legal services um, organizations and get qualified, and there's a lawyer of the day program and some other things available through that program. Um, one of the really important things about it, too, is that we try to um, create a framework around it. So again, it was really important that we not just silo out right to counsel as its own solution because we know it's not a panacea and we know it's not going to be a resolve all thing. And so one of the things that we wanted to make sure it was connected to was um, eviction sealing and screening protections as well as a sort of um, pre-court program. So what, one of the things that happened during the pandemic was an opportunity, if you will, to do that. And so we were able during the pandemic to get law legislation passed that created a pre-filing eviction diversion program. And so what that program does is before a landlord is allowed to file in court to evict someone, they have to apply to this eviction diversion program and attempt to go through the program where they want to talk to a mediator, a counselor, it's connected to the rental assistance program as well. So it's just one application, right? Because we know that a lot of the cases that are coming into um, court are because of money, even though there's a lot of nuance there. Um, that money needs to obviously be a part, part of the conversation. So we wanted to make sure those things were connected. And um, again, how this helps in terms of the record, right, is that a person, before a eviction filing is getting filed against them, they are trying to resolve the case through other means. So that landlord is not able to file that case, and therefore the record is not produced. However, we know that eviction diversion is not going to resolve everything, that there are cases that need to go in front of the court. There's habitability issues. There are accusations being made against tenants that may or may not be true, you know, those sorts of things. And so some cases do need to go to court. Some folks want to have their day in court, and therefore the eviction diversion program is automatically connected to the right to counsel program. So there's an automatic pipeline where we have right to counsel attorneys already connected to the eviction diversion program should it Break, should the uh, negotiations break down. Um, and then the other thing that we did in Philadelphia um, before I left was we were able to pass a law called the Renters Access Act. And so like I told you all before, right, if you are a tenant, inevitably, um, most likely black woman, right, ending up in eviction court, you're going to get a record that is going to follow you for the rest of your life, right? And um, unlike, you know, uh, uh, what the, the, the federal law requires that after a certain amount of time, right, those um, eviction records are no longer reported on your tenant screening report or your credit report. However, they still exist, right? And anybody can go into an eviction database. In Philadelphia, for example, you don't even really need a password. You can just go in there, type up anybody's name, and see eviction records going back to the 1960s, right? And so therefore, no matter what the federal law says, anybody can continue to access those records and, and use them against you. And so what we did in Philadelphia, um, the same tenants actually who... Um, were, let me see if I have a picture of them, mass evicted in West Philadelphia who became a part of the Philadelphia Tenants Union 
um, and who then um, fought for a good cause eviction law, right? Some of the same tenants living in that building then became leaders within the Philadelphia Tenants Union, um, became, broke off from there and created a Philadelphia rent control coalition. Um, and then those same tenants pushed for eviction record sealing in the courts because of what happened to them in, in that mass eviction, right? Through no fault of their own being evicted and then having these eviction records that continue to follow them to this day. Um, and so just these, these tenants are just a force of nature and just why it's really important to approach things from a community perspective because it creates that sustainability. But to say that um, these tenants um, fought for, so in Philadelphia, we now have the Renters Access Act. It is a law that is a tenant screening protection law and it's a fair housing law. And it essentially says that landlords have to do a holistic review of a tenant's application. They cannot have a policy where they are just having a blanket ban against anyone who has an eviction record, right? They can't have a policy that says one eviction record or we're not considering eviction records. Um, and they also cannot have a policy where they are rejecting eviction, uh, rejecting an application solely based on a tenant's credit score because we know both of those things have a racial impact, right? And so that law also requires that um, the landlord provide the tenant who's applying with a copy of any third party screening reports that they use so that that tenant can go and make sure that it's correct. If that information is incorrect, the tenant then has a right to come back to the landlord and say, this is not correct, um, you know, you need to requalify me or to bring back mitigating circumstances and say things have changed or this is inaccurate or, or whatever the case may be, my circumstances have changed. Um, and then the law also requires that a landlord cannot utilize eviction records that are older than four years um, and can't use any eviction records that came up during the pandemic. So all of these things are a part of that law. What we want to see, obviously, is an eviction record sealing law, right? Because even with those things, a landlord can still look back and can still, right, can use records and you wouldn't know. They could lie and say they, or it's also in some ways relying on a tenant to be able to catch that and to be able to go and file something. And it's just really a, a big barrier, but it's, it's something, it's helpful, right? But what we really want to see is eviction record sealing. And so that's something else that, that Philadelphia and Pennsylvania is working on and that I'm able to continue supporting through policy link. So one of the things that we just put out um, just last week was a eviction record sealing report for Pennsylvania, trying to convince Pennsylvania legislators to reintroduce um, eviction sealing legislation. Um, I have some other things to talk about, but I want to do a time check just to make sure there's enough time for questions. Because it's 1 o'clock, and this ends at 1.15, right? Yes, we should close it. Okay, okay. So, yeah. I'm, actually, I'm pretty much done. So, just, <laughs> just to say, right, um, I'll focus on this really quickly. That one of the things that... Um, I've learned from my work at PolicyLink and just over time, right, is that, again, when approaching this idea of racial equity, we can't see it as just a flat dimensional, one dimensional thing. We're doing equity because we're saying we're doing equity and because we're serving people of color or whatever, but that there's really multiple dimensions to equity. And so um, this is a chart that um, I developed through PolicyLink um, with my colleagues on how we think about multi dimensions of equity in pursuing different. Um, campaigns. And so for Right to Counsel specifically, um, you know, it was also a matter of thinking about procedural equity, thinking about the groups that are most negatively impacted by inequities and structural racism as being um, the people that we have to most meaningfully engage in leading, designing, and implementing housing policies. So that was something that we took to heart with the Right to Counsel campaign in Philadelphia. And, you know, just to think, also just to say that some of this is very nonlinear, right? Like I can back on this and fit it neatly into like a camp, but when it's happening, it's not necessarily this, this neat, right? But just to say that, you know, introducing these concepts to you now, you do have an opportunity when you're thinking about your work in a few years um, to sort of think about these multi dimensions of equity if you're going into systems change work. Um, so anyway, so procedural equity, distributional equity, um, making sure that the housing program policies distributed um, benefit um, and burden equitably across communities, providing maximum benefits to those with the greatest housing and health needs, right? Because there's a way that we can implement solutions where it's meant to address and, and um, 
be distributed amongst people evenly and equally and equitably, but that doesn't happen. We saw that actually in California with the um, with the um, uh, ERAP funds, right? And um, PolicyLink put out a report on the um, eviction uh, uh, relief funds that that people apply for, and that people who were most uh, being most impacted by the pandemic and by evictions weren't able to access those funds, right? So there's a way that we can have the laws, right, but that they don't get distributed equity, equitably in, in the way that they're supposed to, and there's lots of examples of that. Um, and then structural equity, housing institutions and systems have processes, practices, and policies in place that operationalize equity in decision making. Um, and then restorative equity and accountability enforcement. So I'm not going to read through all of them. Um, we're going to be putting out this tool online soon. And I encourage y'all to, to connect with Policy Link with our housing team. We we um, will be putting this tool out soon. We're also doing um, work around spatial reparations and reparative spatial equity. Um, so we're going to be doing a fellowship soon and putting out some resources around that as well. So I will end there. So I don't. I'm not going to see up here, but are there? Do folks have questions? Please raise your hands, and I'll. I'm assuming you're good calling on folks, um, but we have a few minutes. It's a great chance to ask her some questions about um, what you just heard. Yes. Hi, my name is Ayo. Thank you for this presentation. I'm a Netherlands student. Um, I have two questions. The first is, the first thing is a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, is there an assumption that the landlords are not part of the black community also? I mean that, or rather would I say, what if the landlord is also a member of the black community? Um, are there any considerations to, you know, because ultimately it's about racial justice. So how do you balance that or actually most of the developers and you know the landlords are they actually just not part of the black community? Have you come across a situation where both sides of the table are members of the black community and how do you do that? You know, has it been balanced in those interests? Because you're you know, you're thinking about you know, the black community. Uh, yeah that's really my first question. I'm still afraid of the second question. <laughs> gotcha, yeah. Um, that's a great question. I think, yes, that has come up in our advocacy considerations, and I think that issue of um, landlords of color came into sharp relief during a pandemic where we saw a lot of what folks call small mom-and-pop landlords sort of um, you know, being impacted by the pandemic. Um, I will say for me as a tenant's advocate, that not, that is not really my concern, whether or not the landlord is black or white, right, in terms of what's happening to my client. Um, but in terms of the larger system, right, it is something that we want to pay attention to because um, it's on average, you know, it, it is the smaller mom and pop landlords who tend to be people of color, who tend to be supporting communities, having the lower rents in the communities, right? So we do want to make sure that um, there's balance in these conversations. And then one of the ways that we were able to do that with the right to counsel work that I didn't get a chance to talk about was that um, the mayor convened a, um, a mayor's eviction prevention task force. And as part of that mayor's eviction prevention task force, um, there were tenant stakeholders at the table as well as landlord stakeholders. So we had representation from the um, landlord association that was in Philadelphia and the leader of that association happened to be a black man as well. So there's, these conversations were definitely had and I think that they're a lot more appropriate in a space of policy. I think in a space of you know representation when you're doing direct representation, it's not something that's going to really be a consideration, right? And and on balance, the power the power imbalance is such that it is more likely to be a white landlord on the other side of the aisle than it is to be a black landlord. Um, but again, in, in sort of the individual cases, that's not really the consideration, right? We're not really bringing up race when it comes to like representing someone in front of a judge who's about to be evicted. That's not really the consideration, but in the larger system, it, it definitely is something that we, we want to be paying attention to. And from my position at PolicyLink, it is something that comes into a lot more of, of my how I think about policy work. Um, 
because I am doing it from a national standpoint and we are trying to get to a system or a place where we envision more expansive ways of um, landlords and developers being a part of the system. So I am working with, um, like for example, black um, developers in California. There's an there's, um, organization called Destination Crenshaw that's doing really amazing, brilliant work um, in, in the Crenshaw neighborhood um, developing out and taking reparative justice approaches in terms of how they do development. So we want to work with them and support their work and there's just different ways that I can do that in policy link than I'm not able to do from a legal services standpoint, if that makes sense. Thank you very much. Yeah. And the second question I had was about, um, there's this course that I'm taking, and I mean, a couple of others that I'm taking, it's called Problem Solving the Public Interest. And right now we're doing what we call toolkits. One of those two kids is racial impact statement mm -hmm. slash racial equity uh, slash racial equity impact assessment. So my question is, um, you know, just to also because in fact my presentation, my son and my team are actually this evening, just to enrich my understanding of it. So. It, have, there, um, have you had to grapple with any revolutions in Philadelphia or you know, propose any revolutions in Philadelphia that require legislation to, you know, before they are being passed or before we need to know, including maybe addiction, legislation on addiction, you know, to have a statement in the legislation or even before it's passed that speaks to the impact of that legislation on a particular race, age, gender, population, which is the whole idea of racial impact statement. Mm -hmm. um, some, some, some states, such as Ohio, have laws that say before the law is passed, there should be a section needed as an introduction of the law that speaks to how that law impacts a certain population, age, gender, or you know, group of people. Yeah. California, we just have a full field regulation that say the legislature must at some point discuss the impact of this proposed law, you know, some sort of assessment. What, 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 is, the, what is the terrain in Philadelphia in this regard? So Philadelphia does not, and Pennsylvania does not have any regulations regarding racial impact statements or um, racial equity impact statements. And it is not something that I foresee happening in Pennsylvania um, anytime soon because of the way Pennsylvania is. It's a very, it's a pretty conservative state. I would say it's purplish, uh, it leans blue sometimes, but it's mostly reddish. Um, and then we also, ha yeah, just, just lots of reasons why we would not probably see that, a legislation for that. But what we did and what we do in Philadelphia is, um, although I wouldn't call them racial equity impact statements, we do tend to put out um, a lot of reports that have data in them that can serve in some ways as a sort of impact statement, right? So one of the things that we did in, in, for the right to counsel law was we got a report called um, a stout report. So it's a, it, it's a basically, it's called stout report, but it's, it's a cost benefit study on what it would cost the city to provide a right to counsel and what the benefits would be. And within that, um, within that report, it had very specific information about race and gender and, and who was, again, being impacted by eviction in the city. So that served um, us very well in terms of getting legislators on board um, in some ways, right, because it's, it's almost telling them that they have a responsibility to do um, something that, that will address these issues. And then the other thing that was happening around that same time was the affirmatively furthering fair housing law that also produced a plan that had very specific race equity um, issues and data in, involved in it. So those are things that helped us and pushed us um, to get the city to do different things that we needed them to do. 
but formally, no, there's no racial impact statements that are required, although some people do use them in their work. Um, if, if, and what we will see sometimes um, certain city council members will do in legislation is they'll have like a preamble or they'll put out a resolution that has some of that data and information. So for example, the Renters Access Act, the, the law that I talked about for the tenant screening protections, we had a city council member put out a resolution that talked about the impacts of evictions and eviction records on certain populations in the city. So that could kind of serve as, 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 as that, in a sense, but yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, the first if you were to talk. Um, so I worked at Legal Aid um, here doing eviction defense for a while, and like, one of the biggest issues was that they couldn't, even like without a right to counsel, like we had funding for lawyers and like we couldn't find anyone to hire. Yeah. And so I'm just curious about um, Philadelphia's right to counsel and reform, if there's things you're doing to try to like build up more lawyers for tenants, just because like I don't know how it would work otherwise. Um, yeah, that's a big challenge across the field in many places. Yeah, exactly you're right. Even in places not having right to counsel, um, staffing up or trying to expand legal services. Um, it's not a problem I have to deal with, fortunately, because I do no longer work at the CLS. Um, but it was it was definitely challenging, and I, I imagine it is still challenging to them. I think one of the ways that, you know, they're thinking about it is sort of a pipeline kind of issue. So going into law schools and talking to folks about the joys of coming to work in eviction prevention and um, starting things like summer programs to allow students to come in and get paid to, to do this work. So I think some of those traditional things, but I, I, I just think it's a general problem all around. Um, and it's, you know, an interesting problem to have, I think, in reverse of what I, when I started in legal services, which is that, um, Everybody wanted to work in legal services and there was not enough funding or money to hire them and now we have funding and money to hire folks and like now there's not <laughs> um, that, that pipeline or network of folks to bring into legal services to do this work specifically. And it's also, I mean, it's, it's burnout work, you know, it's hard, challenging work and I think one of the things that we tried in Philly when we were, you know, when I was there setting up sort of the system was to learn from sort of um, criminal defense, but not replicate it and not have a situation where people were just getting burned out and we were just seeing a lot of turnover. So to really create the circumstances where people felt um, that they were part of a movement and part of a larger thing and part of a larger vision and not just like coming in and grinding. Um, but you, there, there has to be also people who are willing to come in and grind because that is a part of the work. So one of the things that um, I think New York did that, that is really interesting is they started a Housing Justice Leadership Institute, um, which is for attorneys who are already doing the work, but it's, it's just something to help. Um, again, to feel like you're part of something larger and to help try to avoid that burnout and to bring in principles around representation that um, can be a little bit uniform across the field so that we're not all like approaching it in different ways and you can just feel a little, little bit more supported in, in the work. Um, so that's maybe some of the solutions or ways that folks are looking at it, but I think it's a perennial problem, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, one other hand. Okay. If not, um I want to recognize that we're, we're, at the, we're at the close. I did want to make um, just one last comment, I think following on what Tori said, which is one of the reasons I was really delighted that Rashida agreed to come and speak is that um, you know, this idea of housing justice and racial justice being kind of one and the same um, is something that I think we haven't talked about enough because we have a lot of law students. We have a room full here. We have many, many students here um, who are interested in racial justice work. I think historically at UCLA, a lot of students have looked at criminal justice work, have looked at immigration, because those are places where we definitely have seen the intersection of race and justice play out poorly. But housing, I think, increasingly in the last five to 10 years is also now uh, you know, one of these places where you know, it's hard to talk about housing justice without talking about racial justice, I think. You did a great job unpacking some of that. So you know, the hope is that more of you, if you haven't thought about this, will consider this as a potential area of work because there is a huge need <laughs> um, for folks to do this work on the ground and at the policy levels mm -hmm. that, that Rashida is, is talking about as well. So, um, but with that, I wanted to say, um, you know, please join me in thanking our first uh, 2020, uh, fall 2023 um, Maggie Levy Fellow for talking to us today about the, how housing and racial justice is, is intertwined. So thank you, thank Rashida. You. Um, 
this, and um, I wanted to ask this, so I'm going to ask you to talk about it on Wednesday, because she, she dropped in one sentence that I thought was super fascinating, that she has this whole other life as an artist, <laughs> <laughs> and I really want to know how that intersects or doesn't with her social justice work. Um, I, I, I tend to believe the two are, are intertwined as well. Um, she's actually going to speak on Wednesday again. She mentioned this, so if you are not signed up and you're interested in the more career talk conversation, this is more like the big... Um, policy legal issues. Um, she is going to talk more explicitly about you know doing the kind of work she does in legal services and a policy link. So join us on Wednesday. If you're not RSVP, please let me know and I think we can accommodate more students but please do let us know if you're not registered and you want to come on Wednesday. Um, and the last thing I'll say uh, is that if you read if you are here and you want to pick up lunch, <laughs> it's out this door um, and pick it up on your way out. And with that, thank you all for being thank here you. today. Thank you. I'll let you talk to some students. Hi. 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 Hi.